Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Our program will begin shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome member of the National Council on White House History, Teresa Bearhart.
Thank you very much. And uh, those of you that came back from lunch instead of scooting off are going to be very much rewarded as we are very privileged to have in the last row the daughter of the 38th President of the United States, Gerald R. Ford, and First Lady Betty Ford, Susan Ford Bales. Will you stand up, please? No. Will Excuse, excuse me, is my mic dead? Did I say stand up? I see these poor people craning their necks. Is she really here? <laughs> we, we had the great privilege um, the other night to, um, I've had the privilege of interviewing Susan, and it was one of the greatest memories of my life. But I must say, I've been, I've been waiting four years for this to happen. Um, as I say, at luncheon, I learned more about President Jefferson, President Hayes, President Eisenhower, and President Harrison that I did my entire time in school. I mean, and that, that's what's so exciting about this summit. I was also very appreciative that they have decided to name the 250th anniversary of our country, America 250, because in my youth I was involved with the celebration of the Women's Rights Convention which at that point was 150 years old, and I had to memorize Susquehannock. So, um, but, but uh, before we begin, you you heard uh, Nita um, mention to Mrs. Bush that we are being recorded, um, so that you can see this um, for our history happy hour um, session, which is going to be aired tomorrow night, Tuesday. March 17th at 5.30 Eastern Time. And the program is without charge and open to all. So please visit the White House History, whitehousehistory.org to register and learn more about the program. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank our, our board chairman, John Rogers. I'm always afraid to introduce Stuart because the applause lasts longer than the program. But I mean, what he has done is amazing. So with that, the First Ladies have had tremendous impact inside the White House. Um, this is perhaps best exemplified by our founder of the White House Historical Association, Jacqueline Kennedy, who carried out a, a very ambitious refurbishment of the executive mansion. Now, Mrs. Kennedy did not care for the word redecorate, but rather restore, contending that items in the White House must have had a reason for being there, and that this process was really, quote, a question of scholarship, close quote. So the association embraces her spirit with partnerships, and again, a huge debt of gratitude to Anita McBride, um, with America University's First Ladies Initiative and the First Ladies Association for Research and Education, that is F-L-A-R-E, FLAIR. So through these collaborations, the association has engaged with the country's leading experts on this topic, many of whom you will be hearing very shortly. This session, First Ladies' Impact and Influence We'll explore the many ways in which First Ladies have shaped history as the closest advisor to the President, as advocates for both change and continuity, and as well as how they influenced America's society, politics, culture, and diplomacy. Now I have a very great pleasure of introducing what many people consider the brightest jewels in the crown of a First Lady Historians of America. So starting with Dr. Barbara Perry. And while uh, Dr. Perry is walking up here, it should be noted that she just came out today with an article in the publication The Hill on First Ladies in War. Um, and as, as Barbara said, she, uh, she was inspired by the association. So 
Um, she is the Gerald L. Bayless Professor and Director of Presidential Studies at the University of Virginia's Miller Center and currently serves on the board, which we are very honored, the Board of Directors of the White House Historical Association. Joining her on stage are panelist Dr. Diana Carlin, Professor Emerita of Communications, and many have called her the Queen of Communications. <laughs> at St. Louis University. And then we have Dr. Catherine Al Gore, who made a very fabulous statement earlier today in the session, uh, the president of the Massachusetts Historical Society. And Dr. Stacy Cordry, which I understand is a British way to pronounce it. Um, and she is the Dennis and Den Dennis and Vaughn Johnson Endowed Chair of Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Studies at Dickinson State University. This is an incredible panel, and as Stuart has always um, advised us, we have a responsibility here to inspire, to encourage, and to teach. And I think with this panel, you will get an abundance of material. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everyone to this panel on First Ladies. Thank you, Teresa, for that very nice introduction. Thank you to Stuart and to Anita for this amazing summit here in Dallas that we've all been waiting so to participate <laughs> in and attend and to be in person. Um, you and the team at the White House Historical Association have done amazing work, as you always do. And many thanks to my colleagues here, uh, all of whose work has inspired mine over the years, so I'm very grateful to them. Uh, so as Teresa said, we're going to be looking at First Ladies today and thinking about their influence uh, on their president husbands. We're going to be thinking about when they promote change, and sometimes we talked about when they have not been in favor of change, which we can decide <laughs> may be a good or a bad thing. Let me start, uh, I like the last panel when we said let's do a flash poll. How many of you either work in the field of First Ladies or where you work has some connection with First Ladies or you just are a First Lady aficionado? Let's see a show of hands. Great. Well, this is super. We welcome you all and, and for those of you who don't, uh, we hope to uh, spread the word about First Ladies and Flair particularly as well as the White House Historical Association, all of its good work in this field. So we wanted to start with a pretty basic question, and that is, how did the position of First Ladies come to be? That's not in the Constitution, as the presidential uh, position is, and office is, and it's an unelected position, as we know. So how did it start? And I'm going to turn to my first two colleagues to my left here, uh, to Diana, who is writing a book uh, about all First Ladies, a textbook, and you might mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that today. Uh, and we want to start with the, the very first First Ladies, and I also want to turn as well to uh, Catherine Algor, uh, because she's a specialist on the founding First Ladies as well, and particularly Dolly Madison. So let me turn to okay. Diana first. Well, I don't think you can really study the presidency without studying the First Ladies. Now, I'm biased, but I believe that. And it really started because this has been a partnership from the beginning. When Martha Washington arrived in uh, New York, a couple months after uh, the president had arrived. She was greeted with, by the president in a barge. He then, in New Jersey, rowed her over to the uh, shore in New York. She was greeted with a gun salute, and people were yelling, long live Lady Washington. And when she arrived, she found out she already had a schedule. They, they realized that because our president is both head of government and head of state, that there would be events that needed to be planned with dignitaries, that he needed to have these members of Congress there, and that they needed to, to host them. And so nobody was better than Martha at that because she'd been doing it for years. So she had a schedule, she had restrictions, and so it was a two-person career from the very beginning. And she had Abigail at her side, and I'll let Catherine talk a little bit more about that. But Martha definitely uh, understood the concept of soft power, and that has been something that has been um, a trend for First Ladies to use all the way through since the beginning. So the beginning was that Martha really was a partner, as she had been with the president uh, all through their marriage and through his years 
during uh, the Revolutionary War where she would go to the camps, the winter camps every year, and would assist him and try to keep morale up and organize sewing circles and that type of thing. But it was a partnership, it still is, and so the two go together. She was not called First Lady. That didn't really happen until later in the 19th century. She was called Lady Washington, which was the uh, term that was given to her by some of the Revolutionary War soldiers. They even had a Lady Washington's Brigade. And that was sort of a vestige of the British past, but she was also an example of what a Southern lady would be. So that was the beginning. Great. I just think it's really striking. So in other venues, I've actually said that Dolly Madison was the first first lady, and I'm prepared to defend that. But the <laughs> truth is, you're right. Right from the beginning, Martha Washington is getting the message. But what's also true, again, there's an intentionality from her. So she begins dressing a certain way. Mm -hmm. And she, along with George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, maybe John Jay, they start communicating about the kinds of ceremonies that would be proper for a new republic. Because, of course, at that time, they got a real tight kind of like lane to stay in. The American colonists had rebelled against the monarchy. They were going to create the world anew. The world turned upside down. Anti-monarchical, anti-king, anti-royalty. It's all going to be new. Except when it came to ruling, they realized that the only vocabulary of power they had was m monarchical and aristocratic. <laughs> and so how are they going to cut that? And so we have these moments in the historical record where George Washington is wondering exactly how many pairs of matched horses is enough to convey his authority pulling his carriage through, <laughs> and how much would be like too much. I think the answer was three pair. But the same thing with Martha. How would she dress that would convey a sense to the outsiders who are not sure this America thing was going to work, and the new Americans who are not sure this America thing was going to work, that they were being ruled properly and well, and they came up with ceremonies that tried to combine a kind of um, almost democratic energy, I think, mm -hmm. with um, you know some, some kind of vestige of royalty. And that's why I think Lady Washington and uh, Dolly Madison's going to be lady, uh, but she's also going to be Queen Dolly. Yes. Right. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. So, so thoughts about, and we can't leave the founding, um, we certainly need to get to more of Dolly Madison, but um, Abigail Adams, uh, we always cite her letter to her husband uh, about the Constitutional Convention about don't forget the ladies uh, when they were putting together the, the Constitution, but of course, in a way, they did. Um, <laughs> oh, but yeah. any thoughts about uh, Abigail and, and John Adams? And, and moving into the White House. Well, yes, and they're the first couple to move into the White House. Uh, nobody stayed terribly long. Um, <laughs> they weren't impressed. I think Abigail, um, in some ways, embodies another part of the partnership that Diane is talking about. She really wasn't interested in what they would call presiding. So she adopted Martha's innovations and ceremonies rather dutifully. But the, the role that uh, Abigail played was really that of advisor. She really was her husband's closest advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the spirit of Republican virtue, that small r Republican virtue, John Adams made the terrible decision not to change his cabinet. So he ended up with a cabinet full of, let's just call them traitors, all working behind his back. So he would have always relied on Abigail, but in that particular <laughs> circumstance, she really was his very closest um, advisor. And that's fascinating that you mentioned that, Catherine, because really coming up to modern first ladies and contemporary first ladies in terms of personnel issues, uh, we know, for example, that Nancy Reagan, uh, so important on issues of personnel, never afraid to tell her husband, that person should go, mm -hmm. or that person's not good for you. Uh, so it, it clearly starts at the very beginning uh, in that kind of advisory capacity. So before we come back to Dolly, let me turn to my colleague Stacy. And um, we did a panel um, some months ago in the midst of the pandemic when we were always online and, and doing these great panels uh, for the White House Historical Association and for Flair. Um, and and Stacy came up with a set of, um, I, I guess you would call them roadmaps or criteria, just sort of how do we know if a first lady is being influential? How do we know that at the time, if we do know it? What are some of the signposts that we might see? And then afterwards, um, how do we know? What, what are some of the signals that a first lady uh, is, is being influential? Well, these are, um, many of these go back to the very earliest um, first ladies, as, as you two have discussed. 
And, and some of it is um, commonsensical. Did, has she achieved what she said she would achieve in some cases? Um, and on the other end of the scale is we have the Siena First Ladies poll. So just like we take a mm -hmm. sounding of um, what Americans think about how well their president is succeeding, how, where does the First Lady stand in that as well? Um, we look at uh, how uh, her relationship with her husband seems to succeed or fail, how any cause she might espouse um, supports her husband's um, programs. There, there are a number of ways that, that we, I think, try to decide what, uh, whether First Lady is successful or not. It gets tricky when you try to really put a number on it because so many of these causes are causes that are continued um, from uh, First Ladies who preceded them. And, uh, and sometimes the, the, the country changes so much that the causes get um, abandoned because something else comes in their place. Well, it, it seems to me that um, one of the things that we mentioned about uh, Martha Washington, and again will lead us into Dolly, is um, the concept of soft power. Mm -hmm. And um, I am a pseudo-historian. I'm really trained as a political scientist, so we like to think in terms of power and how power is used and defining power. And typically, political scientists and others will define soft power as diplomatic power, um, diplomacy, cultural exchanges. And we know that First Ladies certainly have excelled at that. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's think in those terms, and then let's turn to, to Dolly in that, you called it, Catherine, when we were first talking, this unofficial role, because again, this is a, a position that, that is given to this woman who's the spouse of the president simply because she's the spouse of the president. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I, um, at some point, somebody's going to ask the very rude question, why should we care about first ladies? <laughs> uh, and one of the things is that by studying first ladies, it, the same way studying women, their words, their work, their lives, we learn things we would not have known about. And it cannot just be a record of contributions, but constitutions in that it can change the narrative. And maybe one of the things it's going to do for you political scientists is to change that word soft power, which sounds soft and not powerful, because it may be this thing we're calling soft power might be the power. Mm -hmm. um, studying First Ladies brings out the study of the everyday, for instance, uh, the power of the everyday, the power of material culture in different ways. So to address your question quite directly, and using the roadmap you gave us, She's good on this one. James Madison's major uh, issue that he had to solve was the question of unity. This was alluded to, I think, earlier in the day, but this was the time when the United States of America was uh, referred to in the plural. The United States are, right? Because nobody was sure this Republican experiment was going to hold. Nobody. The outsiders from Europe looking with the jaundiced eye and the people actually, the new Americans themselves. And James Madison believed in unity, and he believed, and he worried, because he didn't think enough unified the cold-blooded New Englanders and the hot-blooded Virginians. And he saw this group of people who were so very different. And he said, you know, we don't have what he called veneration, but history, like we don't even have history, we don't have blood, we barely have a language. And sometimes it will shake you at that, that we all <laughs> understood each other. But we had to have unity. So in theory, he understood unity. He didn't have the appetite. But if you think of it in that way, and then you look at all that Dolly Madison did in helping to found and cement Washington, D.C. as the capital and finally save it, when you look at the parties where she brought people together in the room and made them behave so they got to know each other as human beings, her role as the charismatic figure, uh, w using her dress and her parties, all of that can be seen as fulfilling this role of unity. And you might say unity, which is an emotional or a psychological state, is, quote, soft power. But in the end, it's what got uh, the United States of America into the singular, through the war, and um, off, really off into democracy. And if you haven't read Catherine's book on the Madison's marriage, it's a, it's a perfect union, correct, the title? Well, it's a perfect union, because I do think James and Dolly were perfectly matched, uh, different in a political um, but uh, also perfect union because as historians, we always think, what is the concatenation of person and circumstance? And if the American Revolution had never happened, I guess Dolly would have just been a Virginia gentry wife who threw great parties, by the way. <laughs> but she rose to those circumstances. And just to get back to where you use the word unofficial, um, and again, this is 
I think shows us something important. When I studied the early republic, and, and I did read a little political science, um, <laughs> I figured out that for politics to happen, you need two spheres, and one is official and one is unofficial. And the official sphere, you all know, it's the speeches and the legislator, legislation and the peace treaties and all of that. It's the product of politics. But then there's got to be a process. There's got to be a place where people can get together and they can propose things they might not propose in the official spotlight, the glare of the spotlight. Uh, they have to be able to uh, negotiate. They also have to get to know each other as human beings. And that is the unofficial sphere. And because that takes place in people's homes and at social events, women are disproportionately uh, represented in that sphere. But you need both of those. And if somebody asks me, you know, sometimes what's wrong with Washington, which I don't like to comment on contemporary things, it's the lack of the unofficial sphere. Mm. There's no place where men and women can get together and understand that though you and I might have a very different idea of the public good, we do share a commitment to the public good. And so again, by studying First Ladies, that's where you see the power of that and, and, the, and, and note the absence of it when, when it's gone. Right. Well, I think the importance of Dolly also is that she not only did this for her husband, but Dolly then tutored several other First Ladies who came after her. Mm -hmm. You know, after James Madison died, she moved back to Washington and she held court a lot. But I think about Sarah Polk. And you know, James Pope, probably the most successful one-term president we've had, ran on four parts of a platform and accomplished all of them. He knew his health wasn't in great shape, so he didn't run for a second term. But Sarah spent a lot of time learning from Dolly. Well, she really set the tone for, I mean, yeah. decades. Yeah. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt being the exception that proved the rule. But Mrs. Kennedy, um, I love that she didn't like the idea of redecorating the White House. A lot of people say Dolly redecorated the White House, but what she did was restructure it in a way that Mrs. Kennedy would have proved. By, uh, this is amazing, that before Dolly's White House, which was called the Executive Mansion, and it would only be during her tenure where it would get that familiar, loving nickname, the White House, there was no place in the, in the capital city where all the men of government could get together, let alone their families, let alone visiting diplomats, let alone visiting Americans, let alone anybody. It was, so what Dolly did was she took that executive mansion and she turned it into a center for entertaining where everybody in town would show up, and they did. And she threw weekly parties, and they were as regular and as grueling as they sound, but they became an, an indispensable part of the Washington political machine. Mm -hmm. And it's in those parties, I contend, that these people learned to work together in a bipartisan ways, going towards something they didn't even know was going to happen, which is that this one party republic was going to turn into a two party democracy. You know, we're certainly still in, in the earliest days of this office, but um, Stacy focuses on the early 20th century First Ladies. And so let's turn to her and thoughts about um, how the role had changed. Was it, has it been changing? Did it change? Did the Civil War, for example, change it as we get closer than into the Gilded Age and then the 20th century? Before we talk about change, I think it's worth pointing out that what Dr. Algar has been describing is the consistent through the, through the centuries. Uh, Edith Roosevelt, for example, provided a space where Theodore Roosevelt could meet together with Booker T. Washington. Um, that was not uh, something that could have happened just anywhere in Washington, D.C. You know, so that um, space that First Ladies and First Families in general have provided for gathering um, Americans have, uh, across the political divide has, has been a crucial part of it. I think that's why in historical, historian solidarity with Dr. Algo there, um, unofficial, the unofficial sphere um, is such an important term rather than, I, I know political science is soft power, but that unofficial sphere is integral to the, what the First Lady has always done, even down to today. So changes, well, there's a, there are many changes and um, we can talk more about these, but it has to do with the growth of um, uh, uh, gender expectations, the growth of women's um, activity in the world as we move through the, the century. The Civil War makes changes, women's um, war work, um, and then as we get t towards the Gilded Age and moving into the Progressive Era, the sort of work that women do in the world um, to, to um, move out of their domestic sphere, which was the 
socially dictated acceptable place for women to be. Well, just education. And, yep, yes. yep, carry on. There's, many, there's a million changes. Education is just one. So certainly by the time you reach the uh, first decade of the uh, 20th century and Edith Roosevelt, Helen Taft, you have uh, many similarities, but many, many differences too. So. Well, I think, uh, just to defend my discipline, I think the reason why <laughs> male political scientists focus on soft power is that they also focus on hard power, yeah. and they want to make that distinction. Of course, yeah. they view hard power as the military right. power and the economic sanctions, all of which we're seeing now. But I think in this month of women's history, you know, we want to think um, certainly much more broadly beyond those two categories. Yeah, and when you mention Women's History Month, it's great that we're doing this now because I really think that if you look at the arc of American women's history, you have to look at first ladies once again. We, we, those of us who study first ladies say that they mirror society and women's roles. And so when, by studying those first ladies, you get this little microcosm of what was happening. We talked about this division of spheres. But they also produce change. And so that arc of history were the changes, and so you begin to see the first ladies, for instance, who have an education, who have a college education, Lucy Hayes, the first one. Uh, you see where the first ladies were on suffrage, and interestingly, you did not have them favoring suffrage, uh, at least not explicitly, uh, because politically, it would not have been wise for some of them to have done that, because the suffragists were basically viewed as radical, uh, extremely radical, and then when you look at temperance was another issue that was also tied in with the suffrage movement later. And all of these women were held up to a certain standard as to whether they were serving wine or hard liquor or nothing uh, in the way of alcoholic drinks in the White House. And that all played in with the movement. So it, I really don't think you can separate First Lady's history from American women's history. And there's a paradox too that you're reminding me of, which I think is also part of white women's uh, history which is this paradox. If you had called Dolly Madison a feminist, she would have been horrified. Mm -hmm. First, she would have been confused, because nobody used that word, right? <laughs> but she would have been horrified. And, and you would point out to her, you'd say, well, Mrs. Madison, you know, <clears throat> you go get legislation passed for your you know, constituents in Virginia, those uh, revolutionary war pensions, and don't you get jobs for the sons of your friends and political supporters? That's called patronage, Mrs. Madison. And she would say, I am supporting my husband. <laughs> so I'm supporting my husband and his goals, and I'm not doing anything. And that kind of uh, denial of political intent um, or, uh, I guess, political intent or ambition is so very typical, especially of middling and elite white women. And you see it, these women using I, their very conservative positions mm -hmm. to actually foster what we call radical change. Right. Yeah. And you know, they, they had access to power. And if you look at the anti-suffrage movement, it was often very elite women whose husbands were in powerful positions who opposed it because they had a, a pathway yeah. to power. Yeah. And so some of these women did, not thinking about all the other women who didn't. You, know, you mentioned the book that uh, I'm actually writing it with Anita McBride and Nancy Keegan Smith, who some of you know who was at the National Archives for many years. And the second chapter of our book, we, the first chapter, we look at this whole notion of the evolution of the position, including when the title came into play. But our second chapter is on First Ladies and Civil Rights. And we put that at the front of the book because we wanted to once again show this arc of history through the women who were the First Lady. And so you start with Martha Washington, who brought in slave servants to the homes in both New York and Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, they were doing it Pretty much, they had to skirt the law. If they had kept their enslaved servants there for more than six months, they were free. So they would send them back to Mount Vernon. And so there was this back and forth in order to evade this law. We had 10 families in the White House Historical Association because Michelle Obama brought that to their attention, looked at slavery in the White House. So 10 different families had brought in slave servants. And part of the reason some of them did it was that Congress was so tight with the money for running the household, and they had to use a lot of their own money. It was just they would bring their own enslaved servants with them to save you know, on the funds. So we look in this chapter, starting with Martha Washington and the contributions those early Southern First Ladies made to systemic racism. And then we get into you know, Mary Lincoln, who has an African freed woman who is her dressmaker. 
and she is giving money to the freed slaves who have come to the D.C. area and are living hand to mouth, and she's taking her own money and supporting them. Then you get up to Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, you know, who did amazing things and was actually on a hit list uh, by the Ku Klux Klan. They had a bounty on her head uh, for what she was doing to promote civil rights and to bring the, the issue of lynching out. Lady Bird Johnson's uh, incredible whistle stop to her after the Civil Rights Act in 64. So we really, tra and then of course we get historic Michelle Obama. And so we trace that history and look at where these women sort of fit in from these elite Southern women up to a Michelle Obama. And I think it's a good way for people to see this relationship between first ladies and history and the impact. Right. And social history too. Stacy, I think, did you have your? Oh, I was just going to, um, on the topic of suffrage, uh, there were a small cadre of elite women in America, of course, who did support suffrage. But among elite women, most of whom we can count the first ladies among, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, who was a first daughter, once said, I have more power around my dining room table than I have with one vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great yeah. way to kind of yeah. sum up that attitude. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. She also said, uh, if you can't say something nice, come sit by me, right? <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't she have an embroidered pillow that said that on her couch? I love that. Wow. Um, can we circle back to Mrs. Lincoln? We don't want to quite park on the 20th, 21st century. But some of you here know my personal story of how I became interested in the presidency and the White House. As my dear mother took me to see John F. Kennedy campaigning in our hometown of Louisville, Kentucky in October of 1960, just one month before he was elected. And I always start with that story because my mother was not a political scientist or a historian. She was out in the suburbs of, of Louisville raising baby boomer children, and but was very well read and, and a wonderful grammarian and a champion speller. And, and But she just was drawn to him. We're Catholic. He was the same generation. He was a World War II veteran as it was my father. Um, but the next memory I have of presidents, and I think I was about six, was being taken to Hodgenville, Kentucky, to see Lincoln's birthplace. Mm. Um, so one, one moment taken to see an almost president, one from some time before, uh, and then a couple years later, my dad took me out to the airport in Louisville to see ex-president Eisenhower come through, and he was campaigning in the 1962 midterms, so came from a very bipartisan household. Um, but I always say that when I went at, at age six to see the uh, presidential site of the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln, as a six-year-old, what made the biggest impact on me was the replica of the log cabin that they have there in the replica of the Lincoln Memorial. And the next thing that made such an impact on me, they said, this is a tree that was here when Abraham Lincoln was born. And somehow, just knowing that there was something living there from when he was born just made such an impact on me. So also as a native Kentuckian, I have to think both about him and Mrs. Lincoln. And we talked in one of the earlier panels, of course, about all of us having to deal with different kinds of media. But she was really savaged in the media, was she not, during... Uh, the Civil War. And so can we talk about that and, and then maybe also get into the larger discussion of how First Ladies have dealt with media and the changes in media. So I open that up to our, our group. Can I start with a, just a Dolly connection? Because this was her, <laughs> this was maybe a fatal decision on uh, Mary Todd Lincoln's. By the way, I love that story because that really speaks to the power of place and mm -hmm. person. And sites, presidential and, sites. And, Absolutely. And sites and the materiality of it. Um, and that's something else we should have a whole other panel on. Um, but so I think this is true. So Mary Todd Lincoln tried to make a sort of kinship connection with Dolly Madison because Dolly had had a first husband, John Todd, who perished in uh, a, a yellow fever plague. And the Todd thing was the Mary Todd, Mary Todd Lincoln, Dolly Todd Madison. Okay. And so she tried to emulate Dolly. And so I meant it when I said Dolly set the tone mm -hmm. for first ladies for, you know, two centuries. But she was kind of tone deaf, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like she threw parties in a war, which Dolly had done, but that war is 1812 wars all happening out there. But the, like, the battlefield was like a mile away in Virginia. It was just, it was bad news, wasn't it? Yeah. Far be it for me to be a Mary Todd Lincoln apologist, but... <laughs> I think it is worth noting before Diana jumps into this, because I can see she wants to. <laughs> no first lady ever gets it right. Yeah. 
some big portion of America says, you're doing it completely wrong, and it should be this way. And the other half of America says, you're just perfect, darling. Keep going, right? <laughs> no, no first lady ever gets it right. And so Mary Todd Lincoln had her supporters. She certainly had a lot of detractors. And even among historians today who study her, there are uh, first lady... I guess I would say First Lady scholars of, of different backgrounds who would find Mary Todd Lincoln a figure of tremendous um, pathos. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes, definitely. With a ter just a terrible, terrible life and who didn't deserve nearly the criticism she got. But she was sort of tone deaf about the parties and the dresses and the money she spent. And even her own husband had to say, you know, Mary, you have to dial back some of this grief because remember the rest of the country's grieving as well. So she's, again, I'm not going to be an apologist, but no First Lady has ever had 100% thumbs up from the country. Well, and the thing with Mary Lincoln, too, was that she did a lot of very good things. She did. But she didn't understand public relations, as she probably should have. She was savaged both in the northern press and the southern press because she was a Kentuckian. Some of her, she came from, she had a blended family because her mother had died when she was young, her father remarried. She had uh, half-brothers who were fighting on behalf of the Confederacy. So some of the northerners considered her a traitor. And of course, the South considered her a traitor, being married to Abraham Lincoln and, and being the wife of the president. So she, she really was never going to please everybody, no. uh, whether it was in the North or the South. And she was also a Westerner. And this was something that other first ladies, uh, Rachel Jackson, for example, died before her husband was inaugurated. And some people believe that it was the way she was savaged in the press. They accused, they, they pictured her as this corn cob smoking uh, woman. Of course, they accused her of being a bigamist. And the press was so horrible, you know, she had a stroke and died before he took office. And they, they did the same thing to Margaret Taylor, uh, who was an educated woman, and, sh and tried to portray her also as this corn cob. That was sort of the stereotype of somebody from the West, if you were an East Coast uh, occupant of, of DC. And so Mary went through some of that, too, that she wasn't quite dignified enough. So some of her spending came from her wanting to fit in to this social milieu of Washington, D.C., and be acceptable as someone who was refined. But she was savaged in the press, but she also went to the, the, the hospitals. She would write letters for wounded soldiers. None of that really came out much at the time. And then the support that she gave, like I mentioned in our chapter on, on First Ladies and Civil Rights, where she was actually giving money um, to former slaves uh, to help them live. And this was a type of thing that didn't come out at that point in time, where she needed to take a page out of Julia Tyler, who was John Tyler's second wife, who hired a press agent and made sure that certain articles were placed about her and what she was doing. And Mary just didn't get her positive story out as much as she needed to. Right. Well, let's move f fully and squarely into the 20th century and, uh, again, back to media. And I'm thinking, Stacy, of um, changes in visual media coming on, yellow journalism. Um, how does that affect First Ladies at that early part of the 20th century? You've written so extensively, written on Alice, uh, Roosevelt Longworth, for example, written on, your latest book is on Elizabeth Arden, correct? And um, how women, I'm, I'm presuming, present themselves. So, and if you would like to weave in the fashion uh, component, one of our young colleagues talked at the uh, pre-lunch panel about her podcast, that uh, mm -hmm. she gets young people interested in talking about the fashions of Carolyn Bissett, uh, and, and they end up, being interested in the new, in the new frontier, um, so how have first ladies, as we get into the more visual side of the media and electronic media, um, begin to have an impact in that way? Frankie Cleveland mm. was the youngest first lady. She's about twenty one years old, mm -hmm. um, and she was a um, kind of a celebrity herself. Partly her youth partly the interest in the relationship. She was um, married to a sitting president, where she married Grover Cleveland. And, uh, you know, she became uh, her, her uh, face, her name, got put on advertisements. She could do nothing about it. Drove Grover Cleveland crazy that his wife was used in this way. Um, but, you know, wherever she went, she had crowds following her. Mm -hmm. uh, There's tremendous interest among the American people in Frankie Cleveland. Um, and so, it, you know, this isn't too far uh, ahead in 
um, into the 20th century, as we move to the 20th century, but you know, Edith Roosevelt, by the time we get to that point, Edith Roosevelt was very protective of her family, of her children. She loathed what she referred to as camera fiends, didn't, didn't want the, the photographers around, and had um, posed pictures of all the children taken so that they could be released uh, when the newspapers wanted them. She really did not want her children uh, put for, and, and again, the protection of, of one's children is another through line that goes all the way from the very beginning um, to today. You know, uh, Melania Trump didn't want to move into the White House until Barron had finished his schooling up there, right? So, um, so the, uh, the newspapers, the, the vast increase in the number and types of newspapers published at the, at the end of the 19th century into the 20th century is part of it. Many more um, sort of uh, photographic sections in newspapers and then the women's magazines in particular as they came out began to feature first ladies um, and much of what they said was true and a good bit was not. First ladies tended not to give interviews to journalists of any sort, and when they did, they did not want to be quoted. Uh, partly that was a fear of saying something that would detract from their husband's uh, program or his, his presidency in some way. Um, but it, it was very clear very early on, uh, back to Dr. Algor's era, that the era of study, that the um, First Lady was a phenomenal interest to people. So trying to keep the camera fiends away was almost an, an, a no-hoper. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I mean, we have to look at those, again, these, one of the things women's history has done for us is brought new topics into what, quote, what is history, including things like fashion yep. and sociability. And it's important, whenever it's a first lady, it's never personal. It is always got a policy component. Mm. So Dolly Madison's very sort of authentic personality became a tool of policy for James Madison. And she also used fashion and my form of the media, because the media at the time didn't do things like you're talking about, were um, observers. So I would, when I was researching Dolly Madison, I was terribly interested in her outfits uh, and, and people's reaction to her, and everybody wrote about her. So if you went to one of these parties, you saw on the street, you wrote home about it. And I enjoyed all of reading all of these descriptions of the outfits and the way she was with people. And then I realized that these were not just celebrity mentions, that these were actually a form of political analysis because they were looking at her and evaluating her as whether she was the, of the right ruling class. Is this a proper person? And one of the things that Dolly did is she wrote that line that I sort of mentioned between you know um, Republican virtue exemplified by James Madison who was such a non-entity that he got lost in his own parties and Queen Dolly, who swanned around in fantastical outfits. So she was, Dolly Madison was not a well-dressed woman of fashion. She also did not dress like a real queen in Europe. I don't think she knew what that was. She dressed like what Americans would imagine a queen would be. So fabulous materials, and yes, the turbans with the feathers so that when she's walking around that room in the White House, you know where she is everywhere she goes. And, uh, and, and in fact, these, uh, outfits, which were almost like the colors and the jewel, they were kind of crazy, they, unlike a real queen's outfit, um, she could move quite freely because she needed to come out, she needed to connect, and she needed to touch. And people are writing about this and writing about this, and, and you understand that this is, again, not just as, you know, what, what was she wearing, you know? It was trying to evaluate who this person was. And for the most part, though, Dolly had her haters too, so I have to write, yes, yeah, she did. She got it right, people were very, um, satisfied that they were they had their own queen and that was queen dolly democratic queen but a queen dolly part of mrs lincoln's problem was as um diana said the country was at war so if she spent too much on her clothing then she was criticized for that every first lady going way back to martha washington um, has had to walk a fine line between saying i my white house will uh, reflect the best of Europe. We will be an we will be a Washington D.C. that fits in with every European capital, and you can see this in the way that um, the White House is um, the, the the interior designs, and you can see it in the way I dress, for example. And on the other side, there are first ladies who had to say, "No, we are going to showcase the best of American art and culture, and and I am not going to dress uh, like I were, you know, um, a European queen." Mm -hmm. So you think about Mrs. Carter, for example. I'm really skipping ahead now, but That's Rosalind okay. Carter uh, made a, a virtue in dressing like the everyday woman. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, back up to Edith Roosevelt, who felt this keenly. Edith Roosevelt was not particularly a fashion plate, and she and her daughter got very good at sending out different, slightly different descriptions of the exact same dress to the press. So to find that fine line between being criticized for um, spending too much money and not spending enough money, someone once said of, of Edith Roosevelt, she, something like, Edith Roosevelt says she dressed on $300 a year, and she looks it. <laughs> Fine well, line, very difficult to find that middle ground. And we can think of the, the more recent first ladies, and, and, and my favorite, Jacqueline Kennedy, uh, during the campaign, and we now think of her as this beautiful fashion icon, but during the campaign of 1960, she was being criticized. She says in her oral history, um, the things that used to be viewed as a handicap to my husband, they said because I spoke French or because I dressed in, in a beautiful way, that that was detracting from my husband. Then she said, when I became first lady, then that seemed to help. But during the campaign, she was uh, it was quoted in the paper that um, someone said she spent thirty thousand dollars, right, a year yes. on on her clothing, and she fired back and she said, "Oh, I couldn't spend that much if I wore sable underwear," <laughs> and so she, you know, she took it. Um, Nancy Reagan, uh, of course, ran into this. She was being people her loaned beautiful designer gowns for events at the White House and other events. And then there was a criticism of, was she paying for those or not? And when it came out that perhaps she was not paying and not just having them loaned to her, but she was keeping them in her closet. So you might remember at the White House Correspondence Dinner, she did that great send-up of herself where she dressed like Carol Burnett's charwoman right. and, and sent, came out into the tune of Secondhand Rose, said, I'm wearing second-hand clothes, I'm wearing second-hand clothes. And she brought the house down. And, and if... If you are being attacked and you can make fun of yourself or poke fun at yourself, that's a lesson, of course, to be learned. Let's talk about um, some other technological changes that would have changed the role of First Lady, and that is as travel became uh, more of an opportunity and ease, or ease of travel. So the railroads come into being, and then obviously planes. Um, talk about all of the First Ladies that, that you know and you've studied, and what travel then uh, actually contributed to their own work and to the work of their husbands? Well, the Pokes did a trip down to the south, and Sarah Polk went with him, and this was one of the early opportunities for a woman to be the, beside her husband someplace outside of Washington. You know, this was the thing. If anyone knew about the First Ladies outside of the Washington area, it was either in their home state or from what they were reading in the press. And so with train travel, it then gave the wives an opportunity to travel with the husbands. So they had a very successful run down uh, through several states, and that, I think, was important for some of her image. Um, the Clevelands traveled together. There were several others, Garfields. Mm -hmm. you know, so early on after the train, uh, you know, the Lincolns came from Illinois uh, to Washington on a train from Springfield and had stops all along the way, so people got to see the First Lady before the inauguration. So it, it really was important. So beginning to travel around the country is around important. Around the country, so citizens who won't normally be able to be in Washington get a sense of who the First Family is. Right. And Mrs. Wilson went abroad then with, uh, with Woodrow Wilson, right. the second Mrs. Wilson, correct, after yes. the war? Yes, and just before that, this is uh, another topic that, that comes together um, first Lady scholars tend to look at when did First Ladies begin to campaign with their husbands. Mm -hmm. And so these um, opportunities to travel with the husband uh, began to overlap with campaigning. Mm -hmm. um, some wives went, Edith Roosevelt went, for example, um, on, tr on uh, trips when he was campaigning, not even always for himself, um, and in part to see what he did. You know, so it was useful first ladies or potential first ladies to see how their husbands um, interacted with the public. Um, so Edith, well, the second Mrs. Wilson, uh, Ellen Wilson, was Woodrow Wilson's first wife, and she died in the White House. So when President Wilson remarried, uh, his second wife, Edith, went abroad with him during the time he was uh, negotiating the Treaty of Versailles to, to conclude World War I. And this was... Um, a, a very uh, important moment for her 
to see her husband acclaimed essentially as the savior of the of the war. So that was a, that was an important step forward. But even your um, closer to your era is Lady Bird Johnson and the, the whistle stop. Yes, and the whistle stop campaign. Important. Yeah. So right. even in the era of, of plane travel, mm. you of course had Truman doing the the whistle stop, and then Lady Bird in '64, yeah. as I mentioned which was an incredibly important trip, and that gave her a chance to, to travel and to begin seeing that it was okay for women to, to campaign for their husbands, to be surrogates. And, you know, that's one thing we haven't really talked about yet is this whole surrogate yes. notion and how the wife can do a lot to restore uh, a president's image. And you mentioned Frankie Cleveland, who became Frances Cleveland after she married. For she those did. of you who don't know, he had been, her father was his law partner, and uh, her father died when she was very, very young, and he was her ward, essentially. And everyone thought he was going to marry her mother. And she did a tour of Europe after she graduated from college, and there were all these rumors. And they, she came back from her European tour, and he marries the daughter instead of the mother. Uh, so everyone was enthralled. But if you remember also, Grover Cleveland, uh, Mama, where's my pa? Gone to the White House, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so by marrying Frankie Cleveland, he really had a redemption of his image. And then when he came in for his second term, they had baby Ruth, who the candy bar is named after. Uh, they now have a young child, and, they had a, and the first child born in the White House was their, the Cleveland's second daughter. So it was a, a rehabilitation of Grover Cleveland's image by marrying Frances, and she even had to make some public statements. There were, were rumors that he was abusive. And so she went on record publicly about what a great husband he was and on and on. And so people saw a change in him. And so there was a very different Grover Cleveland as a result. Yeah. And women, you know, Betty Ford, vote for Betty's husband. Because everybody loved Betty Ford. And, and we've seen more and more of that, that the wives often have higher ratings and the husbands. And I don't think of that as surrogate in the sense of a substitute. I think it's an addition. Uh, so Seymour, Seymour Martin Lipset, uh, who's a political scientist, had a category called the charismatic figure. And he was talking about George mm -hmm. Washington that way. And Dolly Madison really pioneered this role, which is that you could be this carrier of your husband's message. You could be a larger than life entity that had good and bad things, because you could also be a but you could be imparting messages of uh, authority and legitimacy, of reassurance, of Americanness, of modernity, the way Jacqueline Kennedy did and Michelle Obama. Uh, so it's like an extension, a personification of your husband's message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and Lady Bird did that really well with great society programs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Extremely well. And then another change that happens, to get back to your question, Barbara, earlier along these lines is women who open up the role of the first lady by opening and simultaneously opening up the White House to the people. I'm thinking about women who were more forthcoming about their health. Mm. I mean, you know, uh, Mrs. Ford, Betty Ford is our, our probably our best example, but she's not the first one who uh, was um, less private about her health concerns and so shared with, with the uh, American people what was going on. Before, th before then, there was a lot of um, health concerns hidden, both of the president and the first lady. And when Betty Ford allowed Americans to learn about her breast cancer, this is something that we can actually put a number to. Yeah. We know yeah. for a fact that, um, in this way, I think Betty Ford saved who knows how many lives, because women uh, went and got mammograms after this happened. And she was, it was, it was a, a kind of bravery, it's hard to reimagine, although some of you will know at that time we didn't even say the word cancer, let alone the word breast, you know. So this is a first lady going beyond what her husband um, had originally imagined. Right. And as you say, can be quantified. Indeed. And last point, speaking of being open and opened up, we would like you to come to the microphones uh, and uh, ask your questions now. Um, and while you're thinking of those, um, just a, a last point about travel by First Ladies. It's exactly 60 years ago this month that Mrs. Kennedy undertook her trip to Pakistan and India uh, by herself, did not, that is, did not go with the president. And those two countries are, are always a bit tense, uh, and certainly during the Cold War. Uh, she did take her sister, Lee Radswell, uh, but they had a, a really charming and, and 
wonderful trip, and that is that concept of diplomacy mm -hmm. and carrying the image of the country in the Cold War when we were trying to tell those countries, we called them then third world, now we would say developing, but we were trying to get them to our side so they wouldn't join in the, the communist side or the Soviet sphere or the Chinese sphere. And she was able to present the country abroad and certainly at home. So with that, let me bring my friend Brandon. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Uh, you can take this as broadly or as narrowly as you desire, but in your opinion, which first lady, singular, or I guess couple first ladies, plural, wielded the most power during their uh, time in the White House? So the question I think most first ladies scholars would come up with would be Edith Wilson, right? I mean, or the answer, rather? No, Dr. Algers looked at me like, maybe not. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm pondering. That, that was such a tricky question. Yeah. Very good, very good. I don't yeah. want to throw Edith, Sarah in at some point. So you He's were, a lawyer. That was why that was tricky. There you go. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was in terrible health throughout most of his life, in fact. And we look back on this now and we see that perhaps he was having um, many strokes, as it were, during his uh, marriage to his first wife. So the, the terrible health problems he had during his second marriage that led, led up to his uh, paralysis and his inability, well, temporary paralysis, in, inability to uh, conduct the business of state, um, I think is, um, is, is probably what leads to the answer of Edith Wilson. And she, I think Edith Wilson, also because she becomes the, the example of what not to do as first lady. Edith Wilson overstepped bounds. She, um, she decided, when, when, when President Wilson was so ill, she made several decisions about him um, that resulted in her not exactly running the country, but she certainly misled the American people. She decided not to tell him the extent of his ill health. She decided not to tell the cabinet the extent of his ill health. She decided not to tell the American people the extent of his ill health. She decided that he should not step down, although there was no, no we didn't have a requirement for that, and the vice president was widely seen as weak or inconsequential. Um, and she continued to um, insist that he would be able to continue to um, be, serve as president. She decided which mail he would see. She decided which people would come to him. She decided which topics uh, he should take up. She determined the timing of all this. And this is all happening in the context of trying to bring a, a conclusion to World War I. So Edith Wilson is the, is the person that uh, we look back to and say, you, you've stepped too far. And, and we see this because even during Nancy Reagan's time when there were intimations that Nancy Reagan was, was too powerful, wore the pants in the Reagan family too many times, uh, journalists at the time called upon Edith Wilson and suggested to Nancy Reagan that she was going to make a misstep akin to Mrs. Wilson's. There are many other, I mean, many, many, many first ladies who are very powerful, but I think that the, the answer would probably start with Edith Wilson. Edith Wilson. All right. yeah. So I'm going to make this case. I knew she would. I'm going to do it. <laughs> so it's the end of the War of 1812. So been in this war, nothing. This is a war that shouldn't have been it ended before it began. They conceded. The British conceded. Don't make me explain it. They conceded. <laughs> but we had the war anyway. And uh, at the end of it, loss of treasure, lives, nothing gained, capital burned to the ground. And yet, the celebrations of this war uh, this is right at the end of Madison, the Madison presidency, and James and Dolly go off in a golden glow. In fact, they can't leave town after uh, the inauguration because people just want to give them parties. And everybody is celebrating this war. It's making the Americans, Albert Gallatin said, feel more American than ever. They're jumping with joy. How did that happen? And I would say that it was Dolly Madison's efforts during the War of 1812 to unify the capital, unify the country, emerge as the savior of Washington City as one of the early stories, that just made Americans feel pretty darn good about this. And that really was the era of good feelings. I don't no, know if I've I'm, convinced you. I'd, go ahead. Yeah, yes. I'd put in a, a plug also for Sarah Polk. Uh, and if, Amy Greenberg's biography of her is outstanding. I highly recommend it. It's uh, Lady First is, is the title. But she was essentially the chief of staff. Um, she. You know, he, as I said, had health issues, and she was perceived by many as very powerful. She was very savvy. She knew how to work her way around Washington and followed a lot of the Dolly Madison, getting the right people together. 
both people on both sides of the aisle respected her. But she would read the newspapers every morning and give him a summary. Uh, she worked on his speeches. Uh, when he was running for governor of Tennessee, she was back in his second campaign when he was the incumbent governor. She was essentially watching over the governorship while he campaigned, and she took a lot of that same practice to the White House. So she would give him far more advice than he'd listen to her advice more than some of his cabinet officials. And so she, and when she was accused of being too powerful or controlling him, she would essentially say, you know, I'm saving his health. She also managed his schedule uh, to try to once again save his energy. And so this would be, I'm just being a good wife. So she used that domestic sphere as her defense that I'm just looking out for his well-being so that he can be president and do the right things. And that was how she deflected some of the criticism. But she was essentially a chief of staff to him. Grace Coolidge was much beloved by the American people in large measure because she was a very uh, traditional wife who dressed very well, was a very good mother, suffered the grief of a, the death of a child in the White House. <laughs> but one of the reasons that people like Grace Coolidge so much is because three first ladies who came before her were widely considered to have had a little too much power. So Edith Wilson mm -hmm. and uh, Helen Heron Taft mm -hmm. and Florence Harding all very powerful first ladies. So Grace benefited from that. Yeah. There is a blowback, though, isn't there, yes, on this always. on accountability and not being elected for the first ladies who come after a first lady who's perceived as powerful. Uh, whether they want to cut back or not, I think they feel the, the pressure from the public to and, do that. And Chris, always, we have a yeah. question here. Yes, uh, I've heard Edith Wilson referred to as our first female president. <laughs> um, and I'm also surprised in this discussion that you haven't mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt, but that's not my question. My, my question is um, political uh, writers and pundits are very free about ranking our best presidents and our worst presidents. And I wonder if you would go so far as to maybe talk about who were our good first ladies and who were our worst. I, I know a lot of people get, they're not elected, they're thrust into the position. Mm -hmm. And some people rise to the occasion and some don't. But I, I just wonder if you would be involved in ranking or dodge that. Uh, uh, <laughs> this audience likes trouble. <laughs> trouble. Causing trouble. Well, that gives us a project to work on, to be sure. Um, I didn't want to take the chair's prerogative, but I will speak about Eleanor Roosevelt. Anyone here from Hyde Park? Well, I'll tell you another site story then. Um, my upcoming book will be on the political relationship between John Kennedy and Eleanor Roosevelt. And we could have a discussion on the power of first ladies after they leave the White House, because so many of them had continuing power, or maybe even more power, mm -hmm. uh, after they left the White House. And certainly Eleanor Roosevelt would fall into a category um, such as that. But she was, was, let's put it this way, very influential on our topic uh, today, if for no other reason the longevity of her time in the White House because of her husband's 12 years there. But I became interested in this particular topic at the site, at the Hyde Park site. I had not been there until 2010. And of course, I went through the main house where FDR was born. And um, I, didn't, I didn't realize I had a personal relationship with him as I felt with President Kennedy because of my mother taking me to see him. And yet I had all these stories that had collected from my parents and my aunts and uncles about coming along in the Depression and what FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt meant to them. And so the ranger, the park ranger, was taking us through the mansion. And we turned a corner and he said, this is the room where Franklin Roosevelt was born. And I burst into tears, very embarrassing to my friend who was accompanying <laughs> me because I was sobbing on his shoulder. Um, but then we went to Valkyll to see Mrs. Roosevelt's home that she had built in part to have her own life and, let's face it, to get away from her domineering mother-in-law. And I saw this picture of President Kennedy, then candidate Kennedy, coming out of the Valkyll living room, Eleanor leading the way with these brilliant, bright smiles. And yet I knew they had a problematic relationship 
politically. And so I wanted to study that. So that will be my next book. But certainly, you would have to put her at or near the top in terms of influential, mm -hmm. not only, again, during her first ladyship, all of the work that she did in so many fields you've already mentioned. We did mention her in relation, for example, to civil rights. She was always telling her husband, you know, please get the anti-lynching bill through mm -hmm. Congress. And yet we have to say, we've, we've said sort of the negative of their not being elected and accountable, but in some ways that was a problem FDR was saying, look, I have to run, and I also have to keep on my side the two-thirds of the Senate and the House who are Southern Democrats. And in order to get my New Deal legislation passed through, I can't put them off by supporting the anti-lynching bill. So sometimes the first ladies have that advantage of not having to worry about being on the ballot, and then sometimes they can't do what they want because they're not on the ballot. But anyway, we'd have to put her up there. And then to have led as our, really our, in some ways, our first ambassador to the United Nations when it was founded after her husband's death, after the war, after World War II, um, the Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and then I'll give her a shout out because in a way she helped Jack Kennedy be elected because they buried the hatchet at a lunch at Valk Hill in August of 1960 and they didn't bury it in each other. So they, <laughs> yeah. they well, came to common ground as we talked about last night at the, at the wonderful panel. You know, can we not find common ground? Those were two people in the same party but had very different backgrounds and very different views and they found common ground and worked with each other. And by the way, again, given that we're in the Women's History Month, President Kennedy named Mrs. Roosevelt to chair his president's commission on the status of women. And that led to having similar commissions on women's rights and the status of women in every one of the 50 states and eventually led to the founding of the National Organization of Women and what we consider to be the modern feminist movement. And, and Eleanor, in, in response to the ranking, Eleanor on most of the polls that have been taken is number one yeah. and, and will stay there. And I think the reason we hadn't mentioned her as one of the powerful first ladies, I think we were thinking of it more in terms of directing the president or, like you yes. said, usurping uh, Wilson. But she redefined what a first lady could be. And that's why I think she's up there at the top. She was the first really activist first lady. She showed how she could go out and really promote what her husband was doing. She was his eyes, his legs, his ears. And so in that sense, it wasn't her own agenda. She was really furthering his and providing him with that feedback from around the country that he couldn't personally get because of his physical limitations. And I think, I think you brought this up, but it, uh, uh, we're successfully avoiding your question, so we have heard it. We're now sidestepping it. But um, I, do, I do think looking at what a first lady does afterwards, because they sometimes wake up to their power, and I would include Mrs. Laura Bush in that an incredibly active post-First Lady lady. Yeah. 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 Yes, I think so. There we go. We'll be seeing her this evening, right? <laughs> yes, next question. Thank you very much for all of your insight. Um, when I think about the influence that First Lady may have, I think about the resources that the First Lady may need to make that influence. So can you talk about how the, the budget for the First Lady has evolved over the years? We, oh. Yes, we may need to yeah, call it a need. Uh, I may need an outside is, There isn't one. <laughs> there hadn't been one, or even office space, or anything else like that. You know, the East Wing is a relatively new uh, phenomenon within the White House from a physical space. Um, Edith Roosevelt was the first to actually hire someone to, to work for her. Uh, and then for many years, they were conscripting people from other departments to help out and agencies. But, uh, you know, people are shocked when I, I do a lot of public lectures on first ladies for both students and other groups. And they're all, they say, well, how much does the first lady get paid? You know, zero. And, <laughs> and they're stunned. It's like, well, but it's a full-time job, yes. But. Edith Roosevelt hired the first social secretary, but she did pay for the caterers out of her own pocket. You know, what would you rather do, write the letters or make the meals? <laughs> um, Anita would be a wonderful person to talk to about the, the money, actually. She'd be our best expert. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this discussion this afternoon. Um, it's my understanding that Eleanor Roosevelt really didn't enjoy the public eye at first and somewhat struggled with, um, with, uh, 
having that, that public persona and getting involved, but then she, she really made a, a breakthrough and became one of our most um, remembered first ladies. My question is, are there other first ladies who had a similar struggle like that and then made that breakthrough uh, and were able to uh, make some really uh, important um, changes in uh, their experience? Well, there were several who um, had at least many years before the presidency to take care of some of that. Uh, both Bushes. <laughs> I think Laura Bush did not expect to be married to a politician, and Barbara Bush was terrified of public speaking, and the way she developed, I'm the communication person, so I really study a lot about <laughs> what they do with their public speaking, but she, at, she would do slideshows when she would go back to Texas. She would take her children around to all the monuments when he was in Congress, and she developed her public speaking skills from doing slideshows back in Texas so that she had a crutch and they weren't looking at her. Lady Bird Johnson sabotaged being valedictorian of her high school graduating class. She purposely got a B in a class so that she wouldn't be, so she wouldn't have to give a speech. And she took a public speaking course with a group of uh, other Senate wives, and that was how she got over it. And she wasn't excited when she married Linda. I mean, many of these women came into this reluctantly, mm -hmm. but then saw because they had a public service commitment, that this was something that was very important to the country and that they could make a real contribution. So they overcame fears of public speaking. They overcame you know, the fear of being out there in the public as Eleanor Roosevelt and so many of the other ones did. But it, it's really more common. We had a few wives who actually prayed uh, Mrs. Pierce, that her husband wouldn't win uh, <laughs> because she didn't want to get involved in it. Most first ladies said they didn't want to be first lady, um, and and some of them that were sort of duped along the way. It was Joe Biden who said to Jill, "Nothing will change. <laughs> Nothing will change for you when you marry me." <laughs> and of course, Eleanor Roosevelt. I think we could right. say started out as an introvert, but she had to become available to be her husband's legs when polio afflicted him in the early 20s. And so that's when she started really going out to speak, in that case, for him or to keep his name out in public and really took lessons from Louis Howe, his, his great political mm -hmm. advisor. Um, and then because she had done that, she actually took public speaking lessons. She began writing to President Kennedy once he was in the White House and told him he needed to see a, a public speech expert <laughs> to, to improve his uh, public speaking. Oh my God. What did Ted Sorensen think? <laughs> well, I don't think she complained. She didn't complain about the speech oh, oh, content. Okay. <laughs> she, she wrote a very complimentary yeah. uh, note about his inaugural address, but later on she said, you, you do need, your throat is too tight, oh. she said. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jill Stuckey, and I'm the superintendent of Jimmy Carter National Historical Park. Thank you. And I want to say something that I say about 10 times a day. Mrs. Carter's name is pronounced Rosalind. She's named after her Aunt Lynn and her cousin Rose. And I always tell people, remember Rose Garden Rosalind. So <laughs> wanted to just make that clear. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank I you very much. Sure, Barbara, if you would allow me to, to say something in the minute we have left. Yes, about we have one minute, and Catherine wishes to speak. Um, it's been, this has been wonderful, and I've done several of these programs for the White House Historical Association. And I've been in the First Lady game about 25 years. And, What's been amazing for me is to see how it's grown as a field of study. It started to be an almost like compulsive um, focus on biography, and it really wasn't clear really why you should care about a particular first lady. Some of them were fascinating, some of them weren't. None of them planned to be first lady, pretty much. Uh, and it's grown from that to actually being a, an intellectually sophisticated category of analysis where looking at first ladies tells us something about women, about power, about American history. And the White House Historical Association has played such a yes. large part in that. And it shouldn't be surprising it was founded by a first lady, but the truth is under Stewart, there has been a real focus on first lady studies, taking it seriously. Obviously having Anita McBride as the leadership in the organization has sharpened that 
and it has been my pleasure to sit with these women and other women over the years and watch this field grow. You've mentioned Flair, mm -hmm. and Flair, which you tell us what it is again? It's First, First Ladies Association for Research and Education. It's brand, fairly brand new, and it really, I would say, it, it, is the, it is the child of the White House Historical Association's focus on First Ladies. So I just want to thank you, Anita and Stuart, wherever you are, but thank you so much. Ditto. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'll draw to a close. And thank you for our audience for your wonderful questions and attention. And uh, enjoy the rest of, of our program. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. This panel was extraordinary. I appreciate so much the sweep of history that you shared with all of us. I did want to say just a little housekeeping uh, note. The buses will leave at 5 o'clock, I believe. Is that 5.30? 5.30 um, from uh, the front of the hotel to go to the Bush Center. So you have about an hour and a half or two hours to rest up. But this was extraordinary. And I will say one thing, just to clarify, for Ms. Rosalind Carter really was the modern First Lady who helped to move the office of First Lady into a bona fide structured office at the White House where even though the office doesn't have its own budget. It's part of the White House budget, but assigned to the First Lady's office. So we really have Rosalind Carter to thank for that. So to, thank you, Stacey, for. Thank you.